Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. And today I have a very special guest who's joining me from the Netherlands, Rich Habits. Welcome to my show. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, you know, I told you before, it's raining here. So uh, <laughs> it's typically the Netherlands. <laughs> yes. Well, um, Rich, you work with clients around the world, though. You may be located there, but your reach is global. And I'm so looking forward to our conversation today. I want to give my listeners a, a hint about who you are before we jump in. So let me give a little bit more of a formal introduction first. Rich is the founder and lead coach at Insight Inc. Over the past 14 years, he's dedicated himself to empowering more than 6,000 individuals and collaborating with more than 30 world-class companies. And what he does is he helps them break through barriers and achieve unparalleled performance. Now, to me, what's interesting is that Rich's clients are not broken. They're already a force to be reckoned with and doing well, but his expertise serves as the catalyst that propels them to even greater heights. And he has operated behind the scene for years as a silent but powerful ally in their journeys. And what Rich's mission is, is to help others harness their untapped potential so they transform their lives into a beacon of success, growth, and personal achievement and accomplishment. You know, Rich, you and I are so aligned in that way because personally, I have that same kind of mission and our company has that too. So I'm, I'm just, for so many reasons, looking forward to tapping into your approach to doing this with clients. Let's start with your professional journey, because I know that you worked in consulting firms. Now you have your own. Talk a little bit about where you started and the work you're doing today. I would love to. So let's see. I I, I graduated. I got my, um, my science degree in 1999. I am, I'm officially a software architect, right? So I design software systems. Well, that's what I, you know, got my degree in. So I started working at a uh, consulting firm, Gemini Consulting, when I was um, 99 and I was 25, yeah, 25. And I started doing that work. And actually, you know, what's funny is that um, they didn't want me at the consultants, at the senior consultant, they didn't accept me. They said, you know, you're way too young. You're not experienced enough. You know, we here were, you know, over 55 and we have decades of experience. We don't, we don't want you. <laughs> That's what they basically said. And, um, but I, I never accept um, when I get uh, th those kinds of remarks. I'm thinking like, okay, I get it from your current point of view. That's not possible. Let me speak to somebody who thinks it's possible. So I just kept in conversation, went from person to person to person to person. And they kind of thought I was a, uh, like, who is this guy? You know, they thought I was a brat or something like that. But I found one guy, he was in his 60s, 65. His name was Franz, which is Dutch name, right? F-R-A-N-S, -F Franz. And he said, you know what? I think we could use some somebody who's fresh and young and you have a different perspective. And I thought, yes. So he took me under his wings for almost seven years. And I just, that was such a lucky break for me because this guy, he's had so much experience and not only content wise, like, you know, um, whatever he was talking about in his, in his job, but also he was a very wise person. He was calm. He didn't get uh, beat up about when things happened. And I just, I just got so intrigued by not only what he knew, but also who he was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had a couple of things when you know when you're young and you're working with all the people also my clients you know in the, in the firm i would work for um for instance sony entertainment they hired us to think about the first version of spotify in, in 2000 right they thought of them they wanted a model to sell their online content without being ripped off by by napster 
And I would be in a room with people over 50. And here I was like 26, 27. And I felt like an imposter. Right? I felt like, oh, you know, what do I have to bring to all these older people? They, I have no clue what I'm thinking. So I thought I have to dress older. I had to look older. So I was dressing, you know, I was looking at expensive suits. And, you know, and uh, back then, <laughs> it was like, I was trying to look more impressive because I thought that's what was needed. And my mentor, Franz, in this case, he, uh, he remember one day after a meeting, he said, Rich, you're not going to be here for long if you keep doing that. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's already a lot of us older people. Right? We don't need you to, to be look, looking like older and more experienced than you are. We all look, know you just graduated two years ago. And we all know you're 27. We're looking for new ideas, fresh ideas that we don't have yet. But if you try to be us, you're not going to win. And I was like, oh, yeah. So <laughs> that really was um, such a lucky break to be working with that guy. And I uh, worked for the management consultant firm for a long time. Then I transitioned into interim management for a while, head of technology for an investment bank. Um, but then I got my first uh, real experience with a coach. And I never knew what coaching was until 2008, I think this was. And I got so much out of that. I thought a coach was somebody in sports, honestly, you know, like a football coach or a soccer coach, a basketball coach, uh, you know, Pat Riley, you know, those guys. That's a coach. But um, I found out that this is just really helpful. You know, I can reflect my ideas. I get good feedback. I start thinking outside of the box. That was amazing. And I kind of, I had the realization, like, what the world needs is good coaching. And in 2009, I made a decision to um, divorce my wife, my wife back then. And um, it wasn't easy, but I felt like, we got married for all the wrong reasons, right? So I ended my marriage and I ended my job at the, and what I was doing at the moment. And I was in a hole because I thought, now what? I want to coach, but how do I start? <laughs> so funny enough, I found a book in my attic from Tony Robbins. It's called Awaken the Giant Within. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that book. With, you know, like, mm -hmm. And... Um, so I found that back in 2009, and I bought that book in 1999 when I was living in Amsterdam. And I bought that one at, book at the only American bookstore that we had in the whole of Netherlands, the only place where you could buy English books. So in 2009, I found it back. And in that book, there was like exercises, right? What are you afraid of? What are your ambitions? And all that stuff. So I was going through the book, and I was reading what I had filled in 10 years before. And I had like this, again, this realization like, Whoa, 10 years later, and I still have the same fears. I still have the same ambitions. I still have the same dreams. I still have the same complaints, right? And somehow that struck me like, if I don't do anything, then in 20 years from now, I'm just going to make a little bit more money. I'm going to be a little bit more, you know, weight put on. I'm going to have a little less hair, and a little bit more belly, <laughs> but I will still have the same dreams, hung-ups, complaints about the world. So it's time for me to do something. I put down the book. I ran downstairs, took down my, opened my laptop, Googled Tony Robbins, and there was, there was a program that he did with Chloe Madonna. It's called Strategic Intervention. And I just booked my spot. And that's really the start of uh, my coaching career, if you want to call it a career. And I did the whole program. I was like, this is it. I want to do this. I, this is what I do, what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So I started being a little bit of a Tony Robbins cover band back then, you know, with the energy. And I didn't speak like him. <laughs> I couldn't, but I was trying to. And um, I freaked out a lot of people with my energy <laughs> because you know, I was a cover band. And I was like, okay, that's not it. What is it? And then somebody... Um, in that Tony Robbins group, another coach said, have you ever heard of a, of a guy called Steve Chandler? And I said, I have no clue who Steve Chandler is. And she sent me a book. What's the book? Fearless. The one with the, the, the girl oh, on the yeah. swing. I, 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 it's one of 15 of his that I've read or more. And I love Fearless. It's a fabulous book. Yeah, it was exactly what I needed in that moment. And I read it. And what I loved about it, short chapters, like three pages, but down i thought this is down to earth down to uh, grounded spirituality 
and grounded psychology, nothing complex, no big frameworks, no, you know, you don't need to study psychology for three years to understand this stuff and you can apply it. And I thought, this is what I want, right? So I got again to my laptop, looked up Steve Chandler. He did a program in Marina del Rey, I think in 2010, 11, probably. And he did it with Rich Litvin. It was called Creating Clients back then. Not Prosperous Coach, was still called Creating Clients. So I booked my spot, went there, did the, the program, loved the program. Um, and then I hired him as my coach. And he's been my coach for um, 12 years, 10, 12 years. Not every week or every other week, right? Sometimes it was longer periods, but he's been so helpful for me. He's been, um, I, I really, uh, I got, you know, raised again as a, as a responsive, uh, responsible adult, actually, through Steve's coaching and sometimes confronting me of stuff that I didn't even see myself. And that really start me, helped me uh, to, to build my coaching business. I started, I still remember getting my first client with 10 sessions for 3K and I was just exhilarated when the guy, client said yes. I'm like, yeah, this is going to work. And then I realized, wait a minute, I need a lot of clients to <laughs> pay my bills like that. And by the way, it's not like it's, it's bad or anything, but, uh, you know, I, I realized this is not doable. So I started thinking, what can I do? What can I combine that will really make a difference? And of course, I got my management consulting experience. So I know how leaders think. I know how businesses work. I know that language. What if I combine that with what I know about the human dimension? And I started doing that more and more for businesses, for small businesses, big businesses, startup businesses, Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Uh, it's now 2023. And I've worked with, like you said, over 6,000 people, over 20 countries, four continents. And um, recently started even also, you know, educating other coaches and consultants and how to become better at the work that they do in corporates. And it's um, it's been an unbelievable journey. I, I meet great people. I meet inspiring people, young people, old people. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, that's the long version of a long story. <laughs> it is, but you know, Rich, I didn't want to interrupt you because it was... I was intrigued with all the things you were bringing out. But one of the things, actually more than one, some of the things that it sounds like were all part of your journey was learning how to show up as the authentic you. It seems like you were trying on different, uh, I don't want to call them personalities, but different ways of being with mm -hmm. the uh, you know, the the Tony Robbins, that wasn't you, and the trying to be older in the consulting firm, and that wasn't you. But you finally, it was like settled in to who you really were and embraced that. And that's who is showing up with your clients today. And I'd, I'd love for you to share what is the impact with your clients when they sense this openness, this vulnerability. And, and I have a reason for asking this. So many leaders probably that you work with, that we have worked with and seen over the years are often afraid or concerned about being too open or vulnerable with their teams. Yeah. And I, so I would love for you to share, what are the benefits of doing that? Wow, that's, you know, um... I was a really loud kid. I was all over the place. You know, uh, in the 80s, you had this cartoon, Speedy Gonzalez. Do you know that cartoon yeah. figure? My yeah. parents called me Speedy Gonzalez because I was all around. I was fast. I was running around. I once stuck my hand in a lion's cage in the in the, in the the zoo. And my parents had to pull it out. That's Literally, that's what I did. Mm. I was breaking stuff. They even got extra insurance because I was breaking so much stuff. But this... This is what happens, right? You go through life like that, and then you get negative experiences. I remember my mom telling me, like, Rich, don't be so loud. You're bothering other people, right? Or don't be so self-expressed. People can't handle you when you're that way. And that's what happens when, you get, when you're a kid. You take that seriously, and you make yourself wrong for it. Hmm. You don't make our parent wrong, right? Because that would be even more threatening, right? If we make a parent wrong, that's, that's not good for a kid. So we make our, we blame ourselves and we, we get smaller and we get to learn that if I am who I am, people can deal with me or don't like me or don't respect me. And then you create all kinds of strategies 
like what I did, trying to look older, trying to look more respectful, trying to look smarter. Um, I actually developed a whole strategy around being smarter than everybody else as a consultant. You know, if I cannot be self-expressed, let me be smarter. So at least I'm going to get respect that way. Mm. Right. And that's been with me for a long period of time. Look, when I was 27, 26, I got pills for high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Right. Back then I thought it's genetics. I didn't see that I was pretending I was putting strategies on top of things that I couldn't be. Mm -hmm. I thought I couldn't be. But over the years, through some excellent coaching and deep work, I'm, I've invested so much in coaching. I wouldn't even believe how much. It must be over six figures, right? And and also the time that I put into coaching still to this day. It's unbelievable work that I've done. And what I see when I'm in companies, it's who I'm being that leaves them with the biggest um, impact, right? Um, in the past, I would go in into a company as a consultant, and it would be all about content and about you know which market should you go in, where did you should go out, where, where should you go out, which products to promote, which one not. Now I get I, I did a session in South Africa once, and afterwards one of the ladies came to me. She said, "You know what? The greatest thing about she said I've been in a lot of corporate trainings, right? She said, but the greatest thing about you is that when you share it." It's lighthearted. It's not pushed down our throat. And I can see that you really, you mean what you're, what you're talking about because you have lived through it. And I love your examples and your openness. And that's what I'm taking with me the most because you're giving me permission to do that myself. And that is such a huge impact for people that we all, we all make ourselves wrong in some way, right? We all think like, I cannot be loud. I cannot be self-expressed. I cannot be... You know, uh, we have a lot of pleasing going on, mm -hmm. right? Let me just not go against the grain with other people are saying, and it's costing us so much, Meredith. I mean, I have so many clients where I walk in the room, in the meeting room, and I just see exactly what's going on. Nobody's speaking up. They're all saying the same things, the same slang that comes from Harvard Business Review, right? What's the newest word? Oh, we, let's talk about sustainability. Everybody's talking sustainability. Nobody's self-expressing. They're all just repeating each other like parrots. And then they wonder why they don't innovate. Mm -hmm. Let's pause there because yeah. when you walk in the room and you observe that, I think it would be very instructive for my listeners and for me to know how, what do you do to open their eyes? I know you don't lecture. So how do you facilitate their learning about how they're being and what would be more effective? Now, let me give you a recent example, German company that I started working with. So um, we did a, a session, two and a half hour session, it was our first session together. Uh, Swiss, Italians, and German, mostly uh, guys in the room, one, one lady, mostly guys. So the lady, the CTO, she wanted me to come over and talk to the group. And she said, you know, we're not innovative anymore. We don't listen to each other. We make a lot of people wrong. We blame, we finger point. Uh, we don't attract the best talent. Uh, even worse, the talent is leaving our company because we're, you know, we, we not, we're not, an open, we don't have an open culture. Can you come over? So nobody wanted me there except the lady, <laughs> right? Which is, which is good. You know, I like a challenge. So we spent two hours about listening, listening, right? How do you listen? Most people don't really understand what listening is. We think listening, we do that with our ears. We actually listen with our brain. Right? We don't see with our eyes, we see it with our brain also. So um, I share this also with you, this metaphor of that we, we think we look at reality, right? but we actually look through a lens at reality. And sometimes it's a, it's a positive lens, sometimes it's a negative lens. Most of the time, it's a ne too negative lens, um, uh, you know, more negative than it needs to be. When you're not aware that you're looking through a lens or through a window, then what you see is the truth. And then you try to change that, right? So you know, the numbers, we had an example. Like somebody said, oh, the KPI went up by 6% last month. One guy looks at it and said, oh, only 6%. Oh, I was expecting 15. And the other guy said, 
it went up. Oh, I thought it went down. Thank God it went up. They're looking at 6%, yet two different lenses, right? Mm -hmm. Who's right or wrong? They're both right in their own world. So with that company, I said, look, how do you listen to each other in this company? And they said, well, when we agree with you, you know, we're your best friends. But if we don't agree with you, we get kind of sarcastic and cynical. And we, we shut you out. Um, when uh, when things happen that we don't like, we, we refer back to old ways of what worked in the past. We're not really looking for new ways. Um, and I said, okay, great. So how do you, you know, work with each other? Well, we have groups, you know, we have groups of people. We have just those three people, they tend to think in this direction. And sometimes it's like, you know, defending points of view in a meeting because we have these groups, you know, they want to be more... Um, looking for opportunities. We want to defend the status quo. And we it becomes like a defensive kind of meeting that we have and we don't get anywhere. I said, okay, good. So I'm not making them wrong, right? Because if you make somebody wrong, you lose them. I'm not mm -hmm. here to make them wrong. And I said, okay, great. What is it costing you? What's the impact of listening that way? And it takes a while before people get really authentic, right? Most people aren't authentic. They kind of, you know, I don't like it, but no, let me not look at it. So they said exactly what I said before. We don't attract the best talent because they don't want to join us. We don't attract a lot of young people. We have mostly older people on the board. Uh, we don't innovate as much. And we know that's a problem in the company. We're being, our Japanese um, competition is winning market share. And we know we need to innovate quicker. But if we don't have young thinking in here, new fresh thinking, it's going to cost us. So, okay, good. All right. Now let's look, what if you would be aware that listening happens with the brain, right? And what I mean by that is the moment you get like information that you don't like, instead of pushing it away, you're actually able to hear it, reflect on it. And you might want to shift your perspective. And they, they were listening like this, right? And... But then once you see, they, they get the idea. I said, okay, so what if you will be able to listen like this? And they'd say, we would be doing that, Rich. We would retain the best talent. We would be able to get more talent. We'd be more innovative. We would win market share. Customer care would actually become customer care instead of just an administrative function that we have. We would have less customer complaints. And I was writing down like 10 things. I didn't say anything. I just asked them, how do you listen now in this way? Great. Nothing right or wrong about that. What's the impact? This and this and this. What's it costing you? This and this and this. What if you listen in that way? This becomes possible. And then I say, which one would you prefer? Well, that one, of course. And I ask them, what's in the way? Um, we need better people. No. We need more training. No. We need a new company culture. I said, well, that's kind of vague, right? What does that mean, new company culture? And then when the girl, the woman who invited me, she said, we need to be able to be those people and let go of those, let go of this mindset and be more there. And it starts with us. It's between us and us, not between anybody else, between you, 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 and you, you know? And she pointed to everybody. She called me a week later, and now we're doing a uh, culture by design program where we're actually looking at the old way of being and the impact and the new way and what it takes for people to shift from here to there. Mm. And all I do is just ask questions and make aware, make them aware of stuff that is there, but that they don't see, like blind spots. Mm -hmm. It's right in front of their face, but they go like, la, 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 they don't see it. it. Your approach is so powerful. I love the fact that you're asking questions. You're not judging. You know, that was a word you didn't use. But they were, because of the lenses they were looking through, there's this constant judgment. Do you agree with me or not? <laughs> oh, yeah. are you, you know, are, is your view the same as mine or different? And and from there, then choosing how they're going to behave with each other. I love that you shared that example because it, it's universal in its potential application. Everyone who is listening to this can think of situations where they are limiting what's possible in the relationship because of how they're viewing one other person or a group of people. 
It's yeah. quite profound. It is. We all are a position. We are a position. We don't have a position. We are a position. We have a point of view, right? And the biggest breakthrough is not the fact that you have a point of view, but coming aware that you are a point of view. Mm. And there's nothing wrong or right with your point of view. But when you think that your point of view is the truth, that's where all trouble starts. Yes. Right? That's so true. I'm curious because you coach individuals. You also work with teams, obviously, like you were just yes. describing. And I, I would love to have you share, because I know a lot of my listeners are in organizations where they bring in individual coaches for specific leaders. And they also do a lot of group kinds of, of um, training programs and other meetings. Mm -hmm. What's been your experience in seeing where the impact happens, maybe the greatest impact as well as the fastest impact? Is it working with people individually or working with a team or a combination? It really depends on the situation. So um, when I look at most of my work comes from somebody in a company, they know me and they say, hey, look, I have a team and it's not really functioning the way I want to, right? Can you work with us? I always want to make sure that the person who calls me, that they have functional software going on. You know what I mean, <laughs> right? If they have a blame game going on, it doesn't make sense to start working with the team. Right. So sometimes I then work like three months with the leader. Right. And once we get the noise out of the way, we're ready to do the program with the team. And then it's not like I do the program. I do the program with the leader together. Because I'm only there for three months, six months, sometimes a year, some companies, seven years. I'm only there for a period of time. But when I'm gone, I want them to actually own everything we talked about. So that's why I do my programs with the leader mm -hmm. right so the leader is responsible i'm never responsible the leader is responsible it's his team so sometimes it's three months one-on-one -on -one, and then we do group work and then we have like follow-up days and in between we might do some one-on-one -on -one work other times uh, i work for a year with the leader before we start working with the team and it mm -hmm. shifts everything around sometimes i never work with the team the leader just gets more clear mm -hmm. and by the way the work that i do between management consulting and coaching as a management consultant, I would be about the content of their job, right? How do you um, introduce an IT system? How do you re-engineer a process? That stuff. Now, the only thing I do is I go in. Because when we go in and they, they start seeing stuff and they shift it around, their outside world changes, right? I don't go about content anymore. I don't talk about content. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to stay out of the content because I see them do things. I'm like, oh no, don't do it that way. But I only look at who are you being while you're looking at what's going on on the outside. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like what you're seeing on the outside, don't go fix the outside, fix you. And then you're more powerful with the outside. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about some of the leaders who do have blind spots and would tend to be somewhat defensive in if, if it's pointed out to them, you're, you're doing this or you're not doing that. And so what are some things that you do? I, I'm imagining someone who's dealing, let's just say with a boss who is not easy to give feedback to, is not easy to approach. There's a parallel there to the work you're doing with leaders in terms of how do you talk to them to reduce their defensiveness and help open their minds so they're able to hear what you're observing. That's the whole art and skill of coaching. Right? That's the whole art and skill. It's um, my most important job is to make sure that whoever's in front of me actually and hear what's there for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, most people I work with, it takes a while before they can actually hear me because they got all that noise going on. And by the way, again, nothing wrong or right. Same goes with me, right? With my coach, I got noise. I got ideas, judgments, you know, preconceived ideas. It should look this way, it should look that way. 
So I don't actually hear. So my first job is how do I make sure that this person actually looks at themselves instead of starting to defend, yeah, but this person and that person in this circumstance. That I think that's 80% of the of the work of a good coach is how do I make sure the person listens for the gold? Mm-hmm. Right? Without making themselves wrong, without making me wrong, without making so they can actually start looking inwards. Let me give you a very simple example of my own life. In my uh, first uh, marriage, I thought I was a good listener. I was a management consultant, right? I've had many, many trainings on listening and all that stuff. And, you know, summarizing. When somebody speaks, you summarize. Oh, you said this and this and this. I thought I was a good listener. So my ex-wife would come home. She would complain about her job. Oh, my boss this and the job that and whatever. And I would be like, okay, let me keep eye contact because that's what I've learned. Let me keep eye contact, right? Let me not, let me I keep my mouth shut while she's talking. And the moment she stopped talking, I would go like, are you, are you done? Yeah, are you finished? Yeah. And then I would just give her like a tsunami of advice. Tomorrow you do this and you do that. You go to your boss, you tell them he cannot do this, blah, blah, blah. And she would look at me and roll her eyes like, she, Rich, you're not listening. And I'd be frustrated because like, what do you mean this is good advice i was listening i was keeping eye contact and i shut my mouth while you were talking so see i was listening and i would be frustrated like i don't understand this lady you know and she'd be frustrated with me mm-hmm. years later actually a lot of people told me that i wasn't listening but i was like what are you talking about i'm, I'm keeping eye contact i'm polite i'm not talking over you so years later, somebody told me, Rich, look, what I just also said earlier, you don't listen with your ears, you listen with your brain. Have you ever noticed when somebody talks to you, there are some words, right? And they come in and you register, and then you have an interpretation of those words. You react to your interpretation to the word of the word of the words, not to the actual words. Mm-hmm. So somebody might say something about your project. And you go like, what? Are you saying something bad about my project? And you become defensive, right? Somebody else might hear the same words and they go like, hey, here's information on how to improve the project. You become defensive. That person becomes curious. What's the difference? It's how you listen. Now, when I became aware of that, I became a much better listener, right? Much better listener. Did somebody tell me to change? No, I had that insight. It was a huge blind spot. And I became 10 times more effective. And, and I think 10 is conservative. I became a much better listener. Mm-hmm. But that's what we all have going on, right? We all have blind spots. And I think the, the job of a good coach is to, how can I make sure they're hearing me and not their own internal noise? Mm-hmm. And that's an art and skill that you, that you, you know, not make anyone wrong patience, use real life examples is what I'm doing. Uh, and just make sure that they understand we all have blind spots. Mm-hmm. If you're a human being, you have blind spots, right? And yeah. that's, yeah, it's no, exciting. It, yes, and you've used that phrase, not making them wrong. I think that's so important because we're, we kind of grow up with this message of somebody's right and somebody's wrong. And and so that again is the lens with which we are evaluating sometimes when we are listening is to judge. Do I agree? Disagree? Is this person right? Am I right? So that sort of attitude really does get in the way of listening. It it prevents us. I think your approach and the example you gave earlier and interacting with the team where you pose the questions and and help them paint the picture of what it's like now, what it would be like if they were this way, draws out from them what it is yeah. they really want. And it seems like that's what you would be doing in a one-on-one. You know, you've mentioned noise a lot, and I want to ask you uh, about a specific application of people having noise in their heads, because it's it's an area that, again, anyone in the workplace deals with, and that is meetings. We all have meetings, whether it's one-on-one or in a group, and we we can come in with a lot of noise in our heads. What are some of the 
guidelines or suggestions you might have for helping meetings be as productive as possible? Excellent question. Yeah, meetings. I hear so many people complain about meetings, right? They got back to back to back to back to back and they cannot get their work done. That's what I hear a lot. So um, the single most important thing is when you come into a meeting, you've got nothing else going on. So you can be present in that meeting, which, by the way, is impossible when you have a back to back to back to back because you've got a nine to 10 and then a 10 to 11, 11 to 12. When you have a 9 to 11, you're going to be late for the 10 to 11 because you have to close this one and you have to go to the other one. You're going to be late. So you're going to uh, already coming in rushed. Right? You're going to be coming in rushed. When you're rushed, you're going to need some time to slow down, really get present with what's being talked about. right? Otherwise, you're going to just not hear what's being said. So my first advice would be don't do back to back to back to back. A meeting is meant to I have an idea, I have an idea, let's build on each other. What do we agree on? What are the actions? Now let's do it and we meet next time. Instead, what I see in meetings, it becomes like, I have an idea, I oppose, and I'm gonna tell you why my idea is better than yours. And then I have other arguments why my ideas boast and I'm looking for people to defend my point of view and you know, get them in my camp so that we can, sometimes even worse, my high, I'm higher in the hierarchy. So that's why my idea is better. It doesn't work either. And then people cannot wait to walk out of those meetings. You see them looking at their watch, like, I have to go to the next one, right? Or they leave to the bathroom. It's just because there's no meeting of the minds. It's just a meeting of ideas. And then we look for, do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Well, if people are rushed when they have stuff in their minds, when they have a point of view to defend, they're not going to be present. And you're going to get this whole yeah, but what if, and I don't know, and I'm not, I'm not aligned, I don't like you. Yeah, that, that going on. I have clients, they have 15-minute meetings. So what they do is this. They start at, let's say, 1 o'clock. They come in a room. They have a cup of coffee or some water. They make sure they go to the bathroom before, so nothing is in the way. They go sit there, and they say, you know, the intention of this meeting is to make a decision on this topic. For instance... Uh, who's going to be the new leader of customer care, for instance, right? This is the decision we're going to make. Everything else we're not going to talk about, okay? All right. Is there anything that needs to be said that's still in the way for being fully present? And then one guy might say, yeah, you know what? My wife's in the hospital and I'm expecting a phone call any minute. And honestly, I'm kind of, you know, caught up with that. So I want you to know that when my phone rings, I'm going to pick up. Okay, great. Great. What you achieve is that at least that's not in this guy's mind, you know, lingering around. He just not, he now knows, right, I got permission to pick up the phone when it's going, right? Mm -hmm. Another guy said, yeah, you know, this morning um, I had to let go of somebody and it's still bothering me. I'm still, uh, I just need to let that go for now. Okay, good. Let it go. All right. Well, I'm going to let that go for now. So what you have is that people got nothing in the way. There's no thoughts, no judgments, no feelings like, oh, you know. And then you said, okay, right? So we got three candidates. What do you say? That person, you said that person. Okay, that per okay. then that person is a choice. 15 minutes, you're done. And it's not because these people are smarter or more qualified or more experienced. They're just more clear. I see that with clients I have. Some people I meet 10 minutes with and they're done for a whole week. They can go, they're ahead. Just, what are you going to do next week? This, this, and this, and this. Okay. There's nothing in the way. There's no judgments. What if, am I good enough? Uh, what if they don't like me? What if people reject me? It's not there. They're clear. And then they go ahead and they make happen what happens. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um I'm just curious if you were saying 15 as in 1-5 or yeah. 50 as in 5-0. 1-5. 1-5. Five. Five. I yeah. love it. Uh, and I think it, it challenges us to be more succinct and to be more clear about the purpose of the conversation or the meeting because, you know, it, it can expand to fit whatever time we've allotted and then we're not as 
focused. I like the yeah. word you used, focus and clarity, so that at, both parties or everybody who's present is aware of the purpose and what you want to do. When you have had meetings where, let's say there's an agenda and there's multiple things, maybe it's a team meeting, what are some effective ways of helping people reach agreements at the end so everyone is clear on who's responsible for doing what? That's an excellent question. I don't look for agreement. I look for alignment. What's your distinction between the two? Agreement means, um, okay, so this is this is the, the the decision that we make. Do you agree with the decision, right? If you if you look at like a group of 15 people, there's always somebody who says, I don't like Bill Wade's language, for instance, or I don't think the number is high enough, or I don't think the timing is right. There's always somebody whose ego needs to be in there. Because when you ask for agreement, you're basically asking like, from your position, do you agree? And there's always people who don't agree. Alignment is different. Alignment is, this is the idea, can you get behind it? Mm. Can you get behind this idea? So we're not asking, can you put your whole ego and your whole personality in this idea? Is it 100%? You're never going to get that because people feel like they're being put in, uh, being forced. Mm -hmm. But when you say, do we align on the idea that we need to bring up customer satisfaction by 8%, right? Now, notice when you say, do we agree that we need to bring up customer satisfaction by 8%? There's always somebody who says, 8% is gonna be very hard. (laughs) You know, we did 5% last year, and then you're gonna get that conversation. Somebody's going to say, well, I came from another company. They're 13%. Yeah, but here we don't do it that way. You get this whole conversation. When you ask for alignment, it's not like eight, nine, seven. It's just, can we get behind this idea? Mm -hmm. Yes. And now let's brainstorm actions. Totally different. Yeah, that's great. I like that. Well, we are at time. We could talk, I know, another hour. Is there anything else... Uh, that you feel you would love to share with my listeners related to what we've talked about today or anything new that you'd like to bring up? There's not much new in my world, but there's really some, look, we always look to the outside. If we don't like it and we want to change the outside, the change is in. It's always in. When everybody looks out, we go in. And it's when I shift my relationship to people, to things, to the world, to everything, even my relationship with myself, the conversations I'm having with myself, the whole world shifts. It's here. Everybody, I've never met a person who couldn't do that. Everybody's powerful, just as powerful as anybody else, but not when we try to change the outside world. The outside world is is busy with whatever they're doing, right? They're caught up with whatever they're doing. Look where you have the power. It's here. And there's much more power there. And that's my mission. To really look at going in, fixing, changing, you know, shifting things around, and then creating a more powerful outside world. That's where it's at. So I would that's my mission for the rest of my life. Well, I admire your admission, your mission. I admire you, Rich, and what you're doing and the impact you're having. I also love your approach. And I know that my listeners who are willing to go within and think about what you've talked about today will discover some amazing possibilities that they might not have even seen before or considered before. And now they will because of what you've shared today. So thank you for being such a gift for my show, my listeners and, and the clients that are lucky to work with you. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. Thanks for tuning in to my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.